Now that we're about a minute or two past the hour, I think it's a great time to get started. So welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Andrew Scammell, and I'm a program associate with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity, or IC program, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. On behalf of the AAAS Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, or IUS initiative, I'd like to welcome you to today's NSF Proposal Preparation Webinar for the Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Directorate for STEM Education, or IUS EDU program which will feature an overview of the program and highlight, cur highlight current proposal submission opportunities. Before I hand it over to our esteemed NSF colleagues, I have a few housekeeping notes I'd like to go through. So first and foremost, this presentation is being recorded. The recording will be made available in the coming weeks on the AAAS IUS website at AAASIUS.org. It will also be shared with you all via email and anyone else who had registered for the webinar. Additionally, we have closed captioning for the session, which you can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who are new to the AAAS IUS initiative, this initiative seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM, teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. We invite you to learn more about the AAAS IUS initiative on our website at AAASIUS.org. You can also follow us on X or formerly Twitter at the IUS program and LinkedIn at AAAS IUS initiative to stay up to date with our latest events and news. So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to pass it over to our NSF, NSF colleagues. So over to y'all. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, can you go to the next slide for me? Uh, my name is Ellen Carpenter, and I'm very glad to be here with you today. I am the lead for the IUS program at the National Science Foundation, and I'm going to be joined by a few of my colleagues who I will let them introduce themselves as we get to their points in the presentation. We're going to be tag teaming a little bit today, so you'll get to hear from all of us. Anyway, we're here to talk to you about the IUS program and a couple of opportunities that have recently become available in the program and that we hope would be of interest to you guys as a whole. Next slide, Drew. First thing I wanted to just point you to are some resources that we have available. Um, we're probably gonna go over a lot of information today. If you have additional questions, going back to our program website and our program solicitation might be good places to start to try to get some additional answers if you need them. So we do have a website. It's on the, the NSF website as a whole. Um, it, the easiest way to find it is actually just uh, using a, a, a search engine and looking for NSF I use, and that should put you right on the, the webpage. Our program solicitation right now is NSF 23-510. So that's the current program solicitation that's active at the moment. I will let you know that these things do change every once in a while. So it's always good to check and make sure that you're working with the current program solicitation. We also have a set of frequently asked questions and that's NSF 23-026. So these can all be found with links through our webpage and hopefully that will give you some additional uh, sources of information if you need it. Next slide. We'd like to talk about a couple things today. I'm gonna to spend a little time talking about the IUS program in general and what our, our goals and expectations are and a little bit about the structure of the program. And that includes a description of the different types of, of uh, tracks and levels that are available within the program, as well as go over what the, the current funding deadlines are. Uh, we also have some opportunities that are um, have recently been introduced that point to this program, and we'll be talking about those in a little bit more detail. Many of them focus on microelectronics or quantum information science education, um, and we've also got a new one that just came out actually last week, so it's brand new, fresh off the press, talking about adaptation, implementation, and dissemination. So again, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what these are, the kinds of things that they're interested in trying to support, and how they might fit in with the IUS program. Next slide. So the IUS program I like to think of is an opportunity to really think about what the future of undergraduate STEM education might look like. So we are a core STEM education program that seeks to promote novel, creative, and transformative approaches to improving STEM education for all undergraduates. So we're a program that's open to all types of institutions that work with undergraduate students, be that two-year colleges, four-year colleges, you know, anything that is going to have an undergraduate student enrolled in it, or is going to be working with undergraduate students as part of their activity. And that can include professional societies and other organizations that engage undergraduate students. 
we place a very high value on educating students to be leaders and innovators in rapidly changing and emerging fields. And that's one of the reasons we'd like to talk about these, these tech-related DCLs today. And we also hope that we are, are going to be assisting the nation in educating a scientifically literate public. So those are the main goals of the IUS program and the main types of activities that we try to support through our funding efforts. We really hope to support projects that bring, um, Drew, you kind of jumped the gun on me. Let's go back just a second. Uh, we really hope to support projects that bring recent advances in STEM knowledge into undergraduate education that really adapt, improve, and incorporate evidence-based practices into STEM teaching and learning, and that hopefully can lay the groundwork to help with institutional improvement and transformation to, to adopt these practices in, the, in STEM education. Next slide. So we have a couple major program goals. Um, the first goal is really to build knowledge about STEM teaching and learning at the undergraduate level. So with this goal, we're really hoping to support efforts that can create novel, transformative, and creative approaches to undergraduate STEM teaching and learning. So to meet this goal, you can certainly focus on students directly. You can focus on faculty professional development or anything that's gonna aid in our, our better understanding of what STEM teaching and learning involves. And that can be across the board in a bunch of different disciplines or within a specific discipline. Um, the second goal is to incorporate evidence-based practices in undergraduate STEM teaching and learning. So there's certainly been a lot of work done on figuring out what works in STEM classrooms, but we'd now like to really focus efforts on how to um, bring those practices into play in many more different types of institutions. And the new DCL that I just referenced, the, uh, the Adaptation, Implementation, and Dissemination DCL speaks directly to this particular program goal. So within this goal, we're really trying to support efforts to adapt, improve, replicate, and include evidence-based practices in STEM teaching and learning, again, for all undergraduate students, not even specifically for STEM majors, but for anyone engaging in any sort of STEM education. And the last program goal is to build and understand systemic change in undergraduate STEM education. And this is really work that we hope happens at an institutional level. As we all know, institutions are very large organizations and sometimes they can be a little slow to adapt to, to things that have been found out about how to improve teaching and learning. So we really hope that efforts supported by the IUS program can help to lay the groundwork for sustained departmental, institutional, or community transformation and improvement again, in the service of improving STEM teaching and learning. Next slide. So the IUS program really has a couple things that it expects from the projects that it, support, it supports. We really want projects to increase what we know about effective STEM education. We, um, at our heart, we are a research program. So we really expect that there will be some sort of knowledge generation coming out of the projects that are proposed in the program. This type of knowledge can be actually acquired in a number of different ways. There's a sort of standard approach by proposing a set of research questions, particularly related to STEM education research, that would be answered through the course of the proposed study. Um, and an alternative might be through evaluation of project activities, impacts, and outcomes to determine how they impact STEM teaching and learning. The other thing we expect from work that we support is making findings available to, to the educational community at large. So we really want projects to think about how to disseminate project efforts. There's certainly standard ways, journal publications, conference presentations, but we really urge you to think about creative dissemination, dissemination efforts that are a little bit beyond um, those types of activities also as part of your proposed projects. Next slide. So the program itself is divided into two main tracks. One track is called Engage Student Learning, and this one really focuses on, on student learning itself. And in this track, we really hope to, to support efforts to increase engagement and learning through developing and using new tools, resources, and models for STEM teaching and learning. And again, to generate knowledge about how students learn and how we can best support their learning. Um, this track is called Engage Student Learning, but the work doesn't necessarily have to be directly on the students. One could think that um, efforts in the, the area of faculty professional development could also lead to engaged student learning. And so that type of work would be certainly appropriate for support under this type of, of um, under this particular track of the program. Within this, this, um, this track, we have three different uh, funding levels. Level one proposals can be uh, supported for up to $400,000 for a term of up to three years. 
Level two proposals uh, are, are from a range of $400 to $750,000, again, for a term of up to three years. And level three proposals would support work in the range of $750,000 to $2 million for up to five years. And the, the level that you want to apply to should really be determined by the scale and the scope of the project that you're proposing. So you need to think about you know, how many students are you planning to engage, how many faculty, um, how many institutions, you know, what's, what's the, uh, the really depth of the work that you're proposing. There certainly is no expectation that you go through these levels sequentially. You don't need a level one project to be uh, competitive for a level two, for example. Again, the, the, the level that you choose really should be dependent on the, the scale and the scope of what you're proposing to do. The other track that we have is called institutional and community transformation. And efforts in this track really focus at the institutional level, um, again, trying to spread and scale up evidence-based practices. The one critical element for projects that are proposed in this track is that they should include a theory of change that underlies the work that's being proposed. And in the process of doing the project, we hope that the project will generate knowledge about what this, the organizational change process entails and how it can be different across different types of institutions. Within this track, we also have three levels. There is a capacity building level, which could provide up to $200,000 for a single institution or up to $400,000 for multiple institutions for a period of up to two years. Capacity building awards are meant for institutions that have not had prior efforts or prior funding in the area of institutional and community transformation. This is really an opportunity to think about what it would take to do one of these larger scale projects in the context of your own institution. Outside of capacity building, we have level one projects that will support work up to $400,000 for up to three years, and level two projects that would support work in the range of $400,000 to $2 million for up to five years. I also want to point out that we really are, are trying to encourage institutions that have not had prior support from the IUS program to really think about applying. And so we wrote a dear colleague letter um, that really encourages institutions that are new to IUS pointing specifically at the engaged student learning level one tier and track, as well as the institutional and community transformation capacity building track. So those might be two areas to investigate if your institution has not had prior funding from the IUS program. Next slide. So the program has two deadlines a year. We receive level one and capacity building programs in January, and our deadline is always the third Wednesday in January. So the next deadline will be coming up next month. It's January 17th, 2024. Um, the second deadline is the third Wednesday in July. And this deadline is for level two and level three proposals in both the engaged student learning and the institutional and community transformation track. Um, these pro these uh, deadlines do occasionally change, hopefully not very often at this point, but it's always uh, to your best interest to really check the program website and the program solicitation in case there are any updates in the, the due dates for the program. Next slide. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about dear colleague letters. I've alluded to these a little bit um, already in my, my, my remarks this morning, but I just wanted to really give you an idea of what a dear colleague letter is. So a dear colleague letter is a document that we produce at NSF that is really intended to inform the proposer community about potential upcoming opportunities or special competitions for supplements to existing awards. Uh, they also announce NSF's interest in receiving proposals in specified topical areas. So these are not particularly, they are not standalone programs on their own, but what they do is they actually point to one or more funding programs that might be interested in, to, in supporting work in a particular area. Um, anything that you propose that is going to be in response to a DCL has to comply with the program requirements that you're actually applying to. And that includes things like deadlines, the funding amounts that the program um, has set up, and inclusion of re required documents in your proposal, and all kinds of things like that. So you really have to have knowledge of two documents, both the Dear Colleague letter that's pointing you in a specific direction, as well as the requirements of the program that you're interested in applying to. You can find more information and copies of these Dear Colleague letters um, through individual program announcements, through program web pages. Um, there's additional information about applying to specific programs and responding in the NSF's Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide. And you can also sign up to have email alerts sent directly to you. 
um, you can do this for particular areas of interest. There's a, a whole checklist of, of areas in which you might be interested in receiving information. But you can do that through NSF's main webpage at nsf.gov. Next slide. We're going to talk about four Dear Colleague letters specifically today that have recently been released to the public. Two of these are focused on the area of microelectronics education. There's the Advancing Microelectronics Education, DCL, as well as the Equitable and Transformative Approaches to Educating the Semiconductor Workforce, DCL. We have another DCL that points to areas of interest in quantum education and development of the quantum workforce, as well as a very new DCL on adaptation, implementation, and dissemination of ideas related to undergraduate STEM education. Um, there are a number of additional DCLs that also include the IUSE program as a, as a partner. Um, you can find more of those by looking at our program website and also by looking at the NSF website as a whole. And I do wanna let you know that DCLs are announced fairly frequently and new ones come along all the time. So this is really an area where it really pays to pay attention to what's going on um, in the specific programs and across the, the NSF as a whole for opportunities that, that might arise um, you know, on a relatively frequent basis. So please make, a, make an attempt to look at the website for more details. Again, sign up for those email alerts. That's actually a really good way to, to find out about DCLs that have just been released and pay attention to information that we send out that hopefully will guide you to these opportunities as they are released. Next slide. Okay, um, we'd like to turn now to looking at a couple of these specific DCLs. The first ones that we'll talk about will be those that focus on microelectronics education. So these are opportunities for STEM education enhancement in the areas of microelectronics, semiconductors, and quantum education. Next slide. So the first thing is, is what might one of these projects look like? So this is actually an example project that was funded a number of years ago that really is looking at what's going on in the world of microelectronics. So the project is Nano Makerspace to make and explore in the world of the small. And it supports work done at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. So the, the, the objectives of, of the project are really to expose students at a variety of levels, as well as the general public to what nanoscale projects actually are or nano, nanoscale systems are. What is the world of the small? And the example that's illustrated on the slide for it, that is very relevant to today is how large is the coronavirus? So that's certainly on the, the nanoscale. And this, this project is really aimed at developing the information systems that can help people understand what nanoscale work type might be. Um, it's also designed to help um, uh, understand how you make things in the micro and nano scale um, using a, a micro nano scale makerspace. So actually the ability to construct objects in the, the micro scale. The project also supports students in making, sharing, giving, learning, tooling, playing, participating, and supporting efforts in this area. And it asserts that knowledge is situated in concepts learned in the context of their use. So basically you learn by doing. So giving students an opportunity to play in the space, to learn exactly what microscale and nanoscale type things might be, and to allow them to participate in activities where they can actually do, do, do things on the scale of a microscale or a nanoscale. And the, the pictures at the bottom just show you some examples from the microelectronics fabrication lab at the Discovery Museum in Boston, which is partially supported by this project as well. Next slide. So the opportunities that we have are based on a couple of different factors right now. Um, as you may have been uh, hearing, as you're, if you're following the, uh, the news media these days, there's unprecedented global demand for semiconductor chips. They're in just about everything. So American companies want to be able to cultivate, recruit, and retain domestic talent in this arena, um, certainly in the area of microelectronics and semiconductors. And so some of the opportunities that we're presenting are aimed at improving American education in these areas, as well as helping workforce development so we can produce the workforce of the future that's going to be able to respond to the need in these emerging industries. So the workforce development programs really need to focus on attraction, retention, and innovative ways to train students from a variety of backgrounds. So uh, we certainly hope that they will include an emphasis on experience, experimental learning, as well as hands-on training that would enable students to step directly from their education into the workforce and have the skills that they'll need to participate in these emerging areas. 
um, projects that have been supported and are encouraging that we are encouraging support of can include universities, community colleges, as well as internships and partnerships with various industrial partners. So the IUS program, as well as other programs in the Directorate of STEM Education, hope to support projects that can educate students and other learners in microelectronics pretty much at all levels. IUS itself focuses on the undergraduate level, but we have other, pro other, other programs that focus in the K-12 and the graduate levels. And so we really are encouraging um, efforts in education and microelectronics across the, the educational spectrum. Um, and these can certainly be formal efforts in the context of schools, universities, colleges, and things like that, as well as informal efforts through museums, libraries, other areas where, where people might engage or where projects might be able to engage with the general public. And projects in general should help students and the community develop an interest and motivation in the fields of microelectronics and semiconductors and aim to improve educational practices for a broad national impact. So not only should the work affect a particular campus or an institution, it should hopefully be available and potentially usable by others at other institutions or in other environments. Um, and we hope that the impacts will be not only scientific, but they will also consider social and economic impact of the work that's being done. Next slide. So the first Dear Colleague letter is really focused specifically on advancing microelectronics education. So the, the goals of this uh, Dear Colleague letter are to build the skills and knowledge for the microelectronics workforce of the future. And the, the um, the uh, DCL was actually released in direct response to the Federal Chips and Science Act of 2022. This DCL is actually very broad. It points to a number of different programs, but one of them is the IUS program. So that's certainly an area where you could think about engaging in, in education for the microelectronics workforce. So the DCL encourages proposals to inspire, study, and support learners' interest and motivation to pursue both the education and careers in microelectronics. And there are a couple of different ways that you can think about how this might fit well within the IUS program. And that might include things like researching and developing curricula for the specific education in microelectronics. It might include educational opportunities to expand equity and opportunity for students from a variety of backgrounds in these areas, as well as to provide professional development for educators, those who may be interested in helping their students prepare for the workforce, but don't necessarily have the skill set to teach the, the relevant skills that are needed right now for the workforce of the future. Next slide. Another recently issued DCL is equitable and transformative approaches to educating the semiconductor workforce. And as you can probably tell from the title, this one does focus very specifically on semiconductor development. This one is a little bit narrower. Um, it focuses on, on a fewer, uh, fewer programs at NSF, but it is, it is actually the result of a partnership that NSF has entered with the Micron Foundation to support development of the future semiconductor workforce. So projects that uh, answer this DCL are really hoped to stimulate transformative approaches to improving and impacting the education and training of advanced memory manufacturing, microelectronics, and semiconductors. So things that very specifically go into the semiconductor industry. Um, there is a call to leverage academic partnerships with industry. So really understanding what the needs of the industry are as one engages in developing academic programs to meet those needs. And another way you can think about another possible, or you can think about several ways that this might align with the IUS program. And that include, might include things like creating and broadening access to existing programs in semiconductor education, building in experiential learning activities specifically focused on the future semiconductor workforce, um, adapting courses, curricula, or certificates to prove, prove skills development and knowledge in this area. You can also think about adapting and implementing evidence-based and instructional practices um, to be more inclusive and to be more uh, specifically tailored toward developing the semiconductor workforce, as well as developing and integrating industry standards into programs of study. Again, leveraging those, those uh, university industry partnerships to understand what the needs of the industry are so they can be built into courses offered at an institution. And again, to provide professional development for faculty and other instructors that can help them develop their own skills that they can then use in helping to train students for the workforce of the future. Next slide. And I'm going to turn it over to Eleanor because this is her area of expertise. Hi, folks. 
Hi folks, I'm Eleanor Sayer. I'm a program officer here in the uh, Director for STEM Education, Division of Undergraduate Education, and I'm on the IUS team. I spend a lot of time with working in the new to IUS strand. So if you if your institution hasn't had IUS funding before, hey, come talk to me. Um, right now, what I want to talk to you about is uh, another dear colleague letter on advancing quantum education and workforce development. Um, this uh, dear colleague letter. Uh, covers many different programs here at the NSF. And broadly speaking, it's looking to support students in education pathways and careers in quantum information science and engineering, which we have smashed into an acronym, QISE, Quantum Information Science and Engineering, and to motivate and prepare students for quantum industries of the future. As you're thinking about how this might align with the IUS program, um, you could think about developing or revising curricula that teach students around quantum information science and engineering. You could think about developing, adapting, or implementing educational approaches that focus on this topic area or which bring best practices from other topic areas to bear on this particular topic area. And of course, you could also think about faculty professional development or teaching uh, te so faculty to teach about quantum information science and engineering, such that their students are motivated and prepared for quantum industries in the future. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna turn this one over to Keith. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Keith Sverdrup, and I'm also uh, one of the people on the IU's leadership team. I'm the Geosciences Program Officer in the Division of Undergraduate Education. The IU's AID, standing for Adaptation, Implementation, and Dissemination, Dear Colleague Letter, is a very broad uh, letter. It covers really all of the disciplines uh, that we fund through uh, the IU's program. The DCL number is 24-026. The easiest way to find it is to simply put that into a, a search engine, NSF 24-026, and you should come up with it. Now, this Dear Colleague letter encourages STEM education communities to submit proposals that focus on adaptation and implementation and or dissemination of proven teaching strategies and learning materials that reflect advances in what is known about undergraduate STEM teaching and learning. These are advances that have been supported in many cases through funding either by the IUS program or the predecessor, predecessor programs to IUS that span roughly 25 years now. Adaptation and implementation of existing and of existing instructional activities is one of the focus areas. Now, while previously proven effective teaching and learning strategies may have contributed to improved undergraduate STEM education at the institution where they were developed, they may also benefit from adaptation to be effective at a different institution, perhaps your home institution, or in a different discipline, or for a different demographic group of students. Proposals with this goal in mind should describe the difference between the learning environments in which the strategy or strategies were developed and in which they will be used and tested, and how that difference justifies the proposed adaptation. Dissemination of existing instructional strategies. Well, these projects should provide avenues for propagating evidence-based STEM teaching practices. This can be accomplished using a variety of approaches. Propagation efforts may include, but certainly are not limited to, training and mentoring future and current faculty in the use of proven open access teaching resources, organizing conferences and workshops that are focused on evidence-based practices, supporting the development of faculty networks and communities of practice, faculty professional development, or other methods to expand adoption and adaptation of best practices in STEM teaching and learning. Now, if you're interested in responding to this DCL, we're gonna ask you to include 
AID DCL, A-I-D space DCL, at the beginning of your proposal title. These proposals may be submitted to either the Engaged Student Learning, ESL, or Institutional and Community Transformation, ICT, track of the IU's program. You're reminded, though, that proposals that are submitted to the ICT track should include a theory of change that is guiding the project efforts. And I will leave it at that and hand it back to you, Ellen. Actually, I think this one is passing to Eleanor. Yeah, I think this one's me. Eleanor, I'm sorry. That's all right. We'll bounce around. We're good at this. Um, so we've talked to you a little bit about uh, these four Dear Colleague letters, which are focusing on um, uh, opportunities in the IUS program. And I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit and talk to you a little bit about what happens when you submit proposals. So um, your organization, your college, your university, your uh, um, uh, your organization will submit a proposal to the NSF via research.gov to the IUS program. After we receive it, we will do um, some sorting to make sure that it gets into a panel. Um, and we will send it out for review to um, experts in the community. We could send it out to panel review, which means that we will send uh, your proposal and a clump of other proposals to experts and they will read it, they will give us, uh, they will write a review on it and then they will meet together to discuss your proposal and a clump of other thematically similar proposals. Or we could send it out for what we call ad hoc review, which means experts in the community will read it and give a review on it, but they will not meet together to discuss. Either way, after your proposal has been reviewed, uh, the program officer who is handling your proposal will conduct an analysis of your proposal, as well as uh, the reviews that came in on it. The program officers will coordinate amongst each other so that the full uh, group of all IUS proposals becomes a really strong and diverse um, portfolio across the entire program. And perhaps your proposal will be uh, recommended for award or decline. This recommendation goes from the program officer to the division director, um, who will then uh, likely concur with that. If it's headed for decline, your organization will get a, I'm sorry, decline letter. And if it's headed for award, it will go up to DGA, which is the Division of Grants and Agreements, who will then process the paperwork to turn this recommendation into an award. Altogether, the process from when you submit your proposal to when it goes through division director concur, DD concur, is about six months. And should it be going over to the Division of Grants and Agreements for award, you can imagine that that's an, about an additional month. And the error bars on this six months could be a few months, plus or minus, either way, more likely to be plus. So as you are thinking about getting your proposal started and putting in a start date, don't make it too quick because it takes us some time to process this well. Next slide. All NSF proposals, including for the IUS program, are re reviewed on two criteria. The first is intellectual merit. And you can think of this as the potential to advance knowledge. What new knowledge are you generating in the course of your uh, proposal, in the course of this project? And how does that push forward the boundaries of human knowledge? IUS can do this as a research program in terms of research questions, or it can do it via a robust evaluation plan. The second merit re review criteria for all NSF proposals is broader impacts. And you can think about this as the potential to benefit society and contribute to the achievements of specific desired societal outcomes, such as in, uh, broadening participation or um, in, uh, uh, um, to include people from more demographic groups or more different, more different institution types. Across both of these merit review criteria, the NSF 
uh, uh, enjoys, our reviewers enjoy, when your proposals have these, have the following three pieces. First, that they are clear. Clarity means, can we tell what you are doing? Does it make sense? Coherence. Are the different pieces of your proposal in alignment with each other? Does your project description match your budget description, match your budget? Is this in alignment with the context of your um, uh, work? And is the need for your project um, uh, coherent with the way in which you um, intend to fulfill this need? The last piece that we uh, worry about is compliance. Are you doing the things you're supposed to do? and not the things you're not supposed to do. And the best way to check for compliance is to make sure that you are responding to the most recent solicitation, because solicitations do change from time to time, and the most recent proposals uh, guide, the PAPG, which comes out every January. Next slide. So you've submitted this proposal. It's clear, it's coherent, it's compliant. What happens next? Well, at the end of our review process, you will receive the individual reviews from each of your reviewers, and these will be anonymized. You won't have their names. If your proposal was discussed in a panel, you'll get a summary of that discussion called the panel summary. If your proposal is being declined, then you will also get an, uh, the results of the analysis from your program officer called the program officer comments. And you will get either an award or decline letter and a process statement about how your proposal uh, was reviewed. When you get this whole packet, it is okay, it is encouraged to email your program officer afterwards about your proposal in the reviews especially if you'd like to uh, uh, revise it and try again next time. In your packet, you will be able to see your program officer's name and their email, and you can reach out to them directly. Next slide. So here's some big pieces of big advice. Please do. Um, you know, hey, search our website for possible programs, because while today we are really enthusiastic about the IUS program, the NSF as a whole, the Directorate for STEM Education in specific, and the Directorate for Undergraduate Education have a whole bunch of other programs, which, depending on what you want to do, might be a better fit for what you're what you're interested in. As you find these possible programs, please read the solicitation. If you're confused about what's in the solicitation or what you want to be doing, um, you can email us about your ideas to ask for guidance about whether they fit in this particular solicitation. You can ask when you are confused. Please, please ask. And if you want to learn a lot really fast about what the IUS program is looking for and what makes for a fabulous proposal, you should think about reviewing for IUS. Um, IUS reviewers, reviewers in general, will get a, a packet of uh, proposals to review. They'll review them. You'll get guidance and help on how to write a good review. You'll meet together with other uh, reviewers and in a in a panel to discuss what's going on here. It is an enormously important and impactful professional development experience. If you have never reviewed for IUS before. Seriously, think about doing this. Um, how can you get in contact with us? Well, you can email us. Send an email to iuse at nsf.gov. Next slide. Here's some other things to expect. As you are um, uh, doing your paperwork, um, it is true that sometimes our regulations change and the formatting changes just a little bit. So that thing that you submitted last year or the year before, or maybe the year before, may no longer be compliant. So, hey, expect this to change. Make sure you're doing the right thing for this time. Plan that you'll get, there will be six to eight months before you receive a decision on your proposal that will impact what you think of for your start dates and how you think about your project timeline. 
you should expect that by the numbers, many proposals are declined. And so expect that you might need to uh, refine your proposals and try again a second time. Also, you should expect that we're gonna have new solicitations and new opportunities coming out frequently. This webinar in particular, we focused on uh, these four dear colleague letters and uh, one of them just came out last week. There will be more in the future, so keep checking. The last thing I want you to expect is that many program officers here at the NSF, including me, are what we call rotators, which means we have academic appointments, we come in and work for the NSF for a few years, and then we go back to academia. So um, it's possible that over the course of your award, your, your uh, program officer might change to be another person. Totally normal. You can always look this up on research.gov if you have questions or email the general inbox and we'll make sure it gets to the right person. Next slide. These are some big questions that we hear a lot, especially from new PIs. Um, is it possible to stretch in new ways? If you're someone who is really enthusiastic about quantum information science and engineering, but you feel like you don't know a lot about education research, is it possible to stretch in a new way and do that? Yes. It's also possible to look, look for some partners. That is allowable and uh, common in the IUS program. We also get queries from teaching focused and small institutions that say like, hey, we're small. We will never have the numbers of that huge research institution down the street. Is IUS for us? Yes. IUS is for you. IUS awards uh, uh, cover all the span of US undergraduate education from teeny colleges to big research institutions, community colleges, regional comprehensives, MSIs. IUS is for you. Another stretch that we, or another, another question that we get a lot is, what is required or forbidden in the IUS program? The easy answer to what is required or forbidden is, well, it's in the solicitation and the PAPG. But uh, if you feel like you're still confused, you've read these things and you're not really sure and you need more clarity, please ask. Send us an email and we will help you figure out if, it, if what you're trying to do is required or forbidden. So, next slide. On those notes, hey, thank you for your interest in improving undergraduate STEM education. My colleagues and I would be delighted to take some questions from you. And I'm starting to see some in the chat already. So, um, Thomas, do we have some slides on? Uh, Q and A, are we, is this our Q and A slide? I think this is our Q and A slide. I believe this is our Q and A slide, yes. Yep. Fabulous, all right, folks, put your Q and A in the chat. So I'm, I'm gonna take the opportunity to just jump in and introduce myself. And oh yes, Abby, come on Let in. you know that I am available if there are questions in particular uh, on microelectronics, semiconductor education, and to a lesser extent, quantum. So my name is Abby Ilamoka. I'm a program director here in the Division of Undergraduate Education. My disciplinary expertise is electrical and computer engineering. And I taught and did research in the area of chip design, chip interconnect optimization for many years before I joined NSF. So I'm particularly excited at the opportunities that have come up in the last two to three years as a result of the Chips and Science Act that permit us to expand greatly uh, educational offerings in the area of microelectronics. So if you have questions related to IUS uh, as a funding mechanism for 
uh, enhancing microelectronics education at your institution. I'd be happy to uh, respond to those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Um, there's one question that was in the chat. It looks like it was directed directly to me. So I'm going to read it and try to answer it. It is a fairly general question. Uh, the question is, uh, the individual understands that ESL level two projects require a larger scale and scope than ESL level one. Um, how, did, how should one determine which level to choose? What factors should be considered when making the decision? Um, does this include the number of participating students and instructors or institutions involved in the research? And is it possible for a single institution to apply for ESL level two? Um, starting with the last question first, yes, it is absolutely possible for a single institution to apply for an ESL level two. Again, um, the scale and the scope really should determine which level you're applying for. You know, if this is a very introductory effort and perhaps you are just starting out and you don't have a lot of, of preliminary data, you might wanna think about level one. I mean, that would let you get your feet wet in the, the project that you're trying to do. You could do it with a limited population of students or at a, you know, one or two institutions, kind of small pool of institutions. If you've got a little bit more preliminary data that says, yes, this looks like this is a really interesting idea and I'd like to scale it and maybe try it outside of my discipline or try it with some collaborators, maybe in several different types of institutions, that might be more suited for a level two. And if you're really having trouble trying to figure out which level is best, again, you know, Eleanor has said, please, please email and ask. That's always a good way to, to get some advice on which level might be appropriate for you to, to start targeting. I'm scrolling through these these oh. questions. Oh, sorry. I'm scrolling through these questions here, and there's some great ones. Um, uh, um, I see one. Can a non-tenure track faculty apply to be a PI for an NSF IUS proposal? Um, yes, <laughs> maybe. Um, the 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 yes maybe is whether or not you can apply to be a PI or a co-PI is dependent on what your institution says. If your institution says you can be a PI, you can be a PI. If your institution says you cannot, you cannot. So talk to your institution first. So I see a question from Sammy Case. If I'm interested in submitting an IUS proposal in response to the DCL, is it reviewed by the same IUS panel or a different panel? So I'm not sure if a response was provided to that, but the answer is no. There is not a separate IUS panel. It will be reviewed typically by the IUS panel for the discipline that is most uh, relevant to the proposal. So if the proposal came in more on the computer science education side, for example, it would be reviewed in a computer science education panel. And please correct me if I'm wrong, the rest of the IU's team. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're, the, it's very hard to determine which panel it would be on, but that points to one of the things I said earlier to make sure that you read the program instructions, the program solicitation, and make sure that you are addressing the requirements of the program. I mean, the, the program requirements are going to supersede the DCL, at least in terms of what you need to include in your proposal and what would be considered um, within the program. You know, we are going to look at the same things, the intellectual merit and the broader impacts across any project that is submitted. Um, in the areas where the, the DCL is pointing to, we really are looking for proposals in that area, but again, they have to meet the criteria for the IUS program as a whole. The only exception to having it on a, a panel, as Abby mentioned, if it's segregated, for example, to computer science or engineering, might be if we receive a lot of proposals in response to a DCL and they appear to be thematically grouped. In that case, we might consider putting all of them together onto a single panel. And that actually would help those of you who are interested in being reviewers, because you would have a, you know, some sort of coherent theme to the panel that you would be working with that might be beneficial as we 
find reviewers with the appropriate expertise to take a look at those proposals. Um, we also have a question about the theory of change. Um, the question is whether, whether we can provide some more information about the theory of change or a definitive description of this. Um, I will point out that there is a webinar archived on the AAAS website that focuses specifically on institutional and community transformation proposals, as well as the theory of change. So that webinar really does dive fairly into depth about what a theory of change is, how it might be applied in IUS work. The other thing is in the IUS program solicitation, we do talk a little bit about what a theory of change is, and we do provide some references in the proposed in the program solicitation. So that might be another good place. There are a couple of articles that are referenced in our reference list that can at least give you the basics of what a theory of change is. Um, I will point out that the theories of change that we've seen incorporated in IU's proposals don't necessarily come from the area of STEM education. They may come from other areas, psychology, business, organizational behavior, things like that. Anywhere that there is a theory that can help guide how um, organizations or groups of individuals might be um, convinced to adapt or adopt to new circumstances or, or new try to trying out new things could certainly be uh, applied as in, in the area of STEM education. I see another question in the chat. Do we need to contact a program officer before submitting to a particular DCL? Generally, no, you're allowed to, um, especially to see if it fits. And each DCL will have in it, if you're required to talk to somebody first, it will say that in the in that Dear Colleague letter. If it doesn't say that, you don't have to ask first. It will say something like, um, uh, proposals responsive to this DCL should start their, their title with. Yes, you should start your title with. But it's not required to talk to us first. This is actually broadly true in um, IUS as a program. You are not required to talk to a program officer before submitting to IUS. You are permitted, but it's not required. So I see a question from Stephen Schultz. Uh, if we're submitting to the DCL 23115, uh, is it designated in the title? Is it still submitted to 23510? Uh, if you look at the DCL itself, the 23115, it does not specifically ask you to designate anything in the title. But we do say that you contact edu underscore chips at nsf.gov, which is a group of program officers that will receive your inquiry uh, and be able to make a note that you're planning to make a submission that is in the microelectronics area. So that, that would be the mechanism to get the attention of the microelectronics uh, program directors. Um, of course, you can also mention in the narrative of the proposal, both in the summary and the uh, proposal description that this proposal is being submitted in response to 23115. I strongly suggest that you do that. We've had a couple questions arise about being a reviewer. Um, I've posted in the chat a link to our reviewer survey. So one of the things to do is to, to express your interest in being a reviewer is to fill out that survey. And what it will do, it will ask you for your contact information. It will also ask you for your areas of expertise and interest. And this allows us, when we're looking at the responses for these surveys, to find reviewers whose expertise and interest matches the proposals that we're looking to have reviewed. I will say that we do get a lot of people applying to be a reviewer, so don't lose hope if we don't call you within the first couple of minutes after receiving your response. Um, we do keep those surveys on file, and we are always looking for reviewers with relevant expertise. So if we don't get to you in this round, hopefully we'll be able to get to you in a, a future round of proposals. I think the reviewer survey also indicates potential availability for dates in September 2023. 
that would have been for a set of panels that we've already already run. But you can also just sort of assume that we're going to have panels on similar schedules next year. So if you'd be available in September 2024, go ahead and set, check yes to that box, and that would be just fine. Um, people often ask if they are allowed to be a reviewer. So here's some quick rundowns of yes and no. Um, you do not, you are not required to have a PhD to review. You're not required to be a tenure track faculty member to review. You're not required to have tenure to review. We will ask you about what your expertise is and about what your background is. And that's because we wanna build panels that are as diverse as possible, both in terms of the personal characteristics of the reviewers and their institutional backgrounds. That's because we want our reviewers to reflect the expertise in the field broadly in the United States. And to do that, we need to know what the expertise is and where you're coming from. Um, you may not review if you submitted to that proposal deadline. So if you are planning to submit to our upcoming deadline in January, you cannot review in the spring. Um, we can still keep your name for later. Uh, but because of complicated and com and uh, uh, somewhat labyrinthine rules around conflicts, conflicts of interest, we need to have a really large pool so that there are no conflicts in the panels that we generate. Feel like we're petering out a bit on the questions in the chat. Folks, if you have more questions, please put them in the chat. Or if you have follow-ups, put them in the chat as well. So I, I'd like to take the, uh, the, the lull in questions as an opportunity to, to give you a little bit more information on the microelectronics and semiconductor funding opportunities. Currently, they are tied to a number of different programs within EDU, uh, the ones that have been covered, at least in, in, in this um, webinar. Uh, so I use is one of them, but there's a whole range of programs uh, across the education directorate through which you can submit um, proposals for funding in, in the microelectronics area. But in addition to those uh, funding opportunities, please stay tuned. There will be additional agency-wide funding opportunities uh, coming from other directorates, either acting on their own or in concert with EDU uh, to do education and workforce development in microelectronics and semiconductors. So just wanted to throw that out, that over the next probably six months to a year, there will be more funding opportunities that will surface. That of course goes to our, our comments about things are always changing. So check early, check often, check every day. There's an email list you can get on and then you don't even have to check. It'll just show up in your inbox. <laughs> See a question in the chat. My school has never received an IUS grant, but years ago I got a twos grant. Two is, twos was the program before IUS and IUS is the intellectual inheritor of the twos program. Um, so does this school qualify for the new to IUS DCL? New to IUS is has your institution has not received IUS funding in the last five years. No, does not have uh, has not had an active award within the last five years. So um, if your twos grant expired more than five years ago, then yes, you qualify for new to IUS. Even if you've had a twos grant you are still new to IUS. It doesn't really matter when it expired. That, yeah. Um, uh, um, do check all the way around your institution to make sure there was not a stealth IUS award somewhere that you were unaware of. Um, but also 
If you have an idea, write up a one pager. I'd be happy to chat with you and I can check up in specific about whether you would be eligible. Uh, there's a question about whether it would be acceptable to include letters of support in an IUS level one proposal from community college faculty, even if you're only considering collecting data without necessarily submitting it collaboratively. Um, if the community college faculty or anybody is going to be a collaborator on your project, it would be wonderful to have a letter of collaboration indicating that they will be working with you. However, the IUS program does not accept letters of support. And that would be a letter from a dean, a department chair, your best friend, simply il illustrating how wonderful you are as a, as a person and how great this project is potentially going to be. Uh, we really want the letters that you have as part of your proposal to focus on a particular role within a project. And within the PAPG, there's actually some suggested language that can be included in a letter of collaboration or it could be the entire letter of collaboration essentially indicates that you will collaborate with the project as described in the project description. That's perfectly fine to include as a letter of collaboration. What we don't want these letters to do is I is A, to, I, to be a letter of support, again, a rah-rah cheerleader kind of letter for your project, or to supersede the information that is already in the project description. We give you 15 pages to write out a project description and everything that the reviewers need to know about your project should be included in that project description. It should not be included in letters of support or other documents that you have attached to your file. Other bonus documents. Other there bonus will be documents. A, yeah, there will be, a, like, you're going to give us information in your budget, in your budget justification, your facilities plan. All of that is part of your proposal. But we don't want extra bonus information to come in in a letter. We do deeply appreciate that if anybody is going to be doing work on this project and they're not from your institution, a letter that says, I promise to do the work as described in the project description, because then we know they're on board. But don't add extra info. Yes, reviewers do look very critically at, at making sure that folks that are supposed to be part of the project have agreed to be part of the project. Um, I see another one here. Um, uh, if I apply to IUS EDU, does it have to be related to microelectronics education or can it just be improving STEM education? IUS EDU is all about improving undergraduate STEM education, all the parts of undergraduate STEM education. If your project is about microelectronics education, then it might be responsive to this Dear Colleague letter. And so you could call it out as responsive to the Dear Colleague letter, but IUS as a whole takes projects across the whole spectrum of undergraduate STEM education. It's not required that you do microelectronics only. And there's another question for project descriptions. How should the research questions be structured? Should they be based around a specific educational theory? Um, that pretty much is up to you. This is your role as the principal investigator of a project is to figure out how to ask the questions that you would like to answer. Um, if, a, if there's a theory that is appropriate, by all means, include it. But if there's no theory and you are just asking questions that you find interesting and that you hope to be able to answer from the data you're collecting, it's perfectly fine to include them in that form as well. The thing we care about is coherence. If you have identified a, a research question or an area to investigate or a problem to solve, we would like you to clearly articulate it, that's clarity, and then we would like whatever you're going to be doing about it, answering your question, solving your problem, to be coherent with the question or problem that you post. And compliant. We'll put the third yes, C in there. Compliant. So. Yes, Co clarity, coherence, and compliance. We appreciate all three. Uh, another question, should biosketches and current and pending information be included for non-funded collaborators, both internally and externally? Um, 
think that probably depends on the extent of the collaboration. You know, if a person is included as a project PI, a co-PI, or a senior personnel, that there is an expectation that a biosketch would be included. I think there's a requirement that a biosketch is included for those personnel. If this is just um, a project partner, for example, if you have 40 project partners at different institutions that are all going to be sending you bits of data, you probably don't need a biosketch for each of those individuals. Um, Again, if they are not going to be funded through the award and they are not a co-PI, a PI, or the senior personnel, you do not need current and pending support information for those individuals. Um, if, we, if we find something after the fact that we think might be missing, we can always ask you for it. And in fact, we do tend to do that fairly regularly, particularly if a project is being, is being recommended for an award. Uh, is it possible to find previously funded successful IUS projects to get an idea? NSF award search is the most powerful tool for you to figure out what has been funded previously anywhere in the NSF, but especially in the IUS program. You can search in NSF award search for previous IUS awards, which give you thousands. You can add some more keywords so that it sounds kind of like the thing you want to do. You'll get as many projects as we find or the, as we have funded that are related to the keywords you put in. And uh, for each of those projects, you will be able to see an abstract of the project, the name and contact information of the PI, the name and contact information of the program officer, and you are allowed to write to the PI and ask. But we're not going to give them to you. Sounds like a Monday afternoon. Yeah. Folks, you got more questions here? There's, this chat has been scrolling. If there's a question that you had and we have not yet answered it, you should imagine that we missed it and go ahead and put it in the chat again. How does NSF screen proposals for plagiarism or similarity? Um, electronic tools is the short answer. We actually do look at all proposals and we screen them against things that have been submitted to NSF. And particularly if an investigator has already submitted a proposal, we do take a look at what's in a, a current one versus what's already come into the NSF. But luckily we don't have to do that manually. Um, I see, are letters of collaboration required? Um, no, but they're generally a good idea. And whether the slides will be posted, this entire webinar will actually be posted to the AAAS website. I think it'll take a couple of days to process and get it up there. But at that point, you'll have access to the entire thing and that includes the question and answer session. So you can go back through the slides as well as our narration and any of the questions that we've been able to answer as part of today's session. Uh, if I have community colleges involved as stakeholders in my proposal with respect to a bridge program, besides these letters of collaboration, do I need anything else from them? Uh, this is gonna depend on what your project is doing with them and um, what, what, how your project is structured. So for if, for example, you are giving them a sub-award, then you will need to do the paperwork for a sub-award. Um, if this is a collaborative project with community colleges, there will be um, information related to being a collaborative project. If they're just showing up and writing you letters because you're, you are, yeah, the, that's the extent of your collaboration, that's okay too. 
the details matter. So write us a one pager, send it to IUSE at NSF.gov. We'll make sure it gets to the right person to give you more specific feedback. All right, we have a question. What types of enabling technologies are allowable for funding um, instruments, et cetera? I'm actually not sure what the question is. Richard, if you're there, would you like to unmute and perhaps uh, give us a little bit more elaboration? Sure, so suppose I'm, um, I've got a project that is going to be uh, bringing a technology to various courses and being used in outreach, such as uh, an infrared spectrometer or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Would that be an acceptable uh, item in a proposal? Absolutely, it would. I mean, the, the critical element is to make sure that the reviewers understand that this is dedicated to undergraduate STEM education, that it's not an instrument that would be ordered you know, to benefit faculty at your institution, but undergraduates might get to use it on the occasional second Thursday, that sort of thing. It really should be integral to the project and what you're intending to, to help the students learn. Thank you. Broadly speaking, it's not forbidden to have a proposal which focuses on buying lots of equipment, but proposals that focus on buying lots of equipment tend to fare poorly because they don't have a lot of budget or intellectual room left over for um, actually improving undergraduate STEM education, building new pedagogy, training TAs, figuring out if this uh, um, if uh, improvements are working and if so how. Right, there are some there are some critical instruments that are very useful in in undergraduate oh. STEM teaching and learning, which is great to have too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Equipment is definitely allowed. Yeah, that's that's the intent here. Okay. So on that note, I would like uh, to add that in the microelectronics domain, one of the biggest impediments to teaching and learning uh, at the undergraduate level and even the pre-college level is access to infrastructure for chip design. Um, this is uh, something that NSF recognizes that it is important. In fact, uh, excellent, um, 23118, excellent and I use, um, stress the importance of hands-on learning. If you're gonna uh, train folks to design chips, fabricate chips, test, verify performance, they need to understand how those chips are made. So we understand that access to fabrication facilities uh, would be uh, very important. And so in those kinds of proposals, uh, please make the case for access, the need for access. If you have partnerships of some sort established with fab facilities in the region, then let us know. If you have a need to purchase software, software licenses, software maintenance contracts that would allow you to have access to um, EDA software for chip design. Um, please include that in the proposal and certainly in the budget. We understand that it's important to have that opportunity. It's not essential. I, I make this point to folks as well that um, there are many institutions that don't have direct access to FAB facilities. Uh, there are many NSF funded videos, AR, VR, augmented reality uh, opportunities to see what happens in a foundry without actually going to a foundry. And so there are ways around uh, purchasing expensive chip making equipment or access to, to the facilities. Uh, get in touch with folks listed in the DCLs, and we can point you to 
the uh, right places to find those videos and other resources. Thank you. Piggybacking on that thing that Abby just said, hey, get in touch. Um, if you have specific questions about your specific project, pieces that you are um, confused about, pieces that you need more clarity around, um, uh, send us an email. I use it nsf.gov. If you have a one-page synopsis of what your project is about included in that email, we will make sure that your email gets to the right person to answer your questions. So um, some of these DCLs have specific emails attached to them. You can, if you have a, a DCL related question, you can send it to those emails. Or if you have a general IUS question or a question about IUS and a DCL, you can send it to the general IUS box, IUS at nsf.gov, and we'll get it out to the right person for you. I realized I just told everyone to email us later as if there would be no further questions now. That was a, a not a strategic move on my part. Yeah, it does sound like we're we're winding down a little bit here. Yeah. Drew, are you ready for it to turn us ready for us to turn it back over to you? Yep. If yeah, it seems as the wonderful questions are winding down. As you said, y'all are more than welcome to accept them via email later time. So I'll finish this up here. Um so before we go, I'd like to thank our NSF colleagues, the rest of the IC team, and all of you who are able to join and participate in the webinar today. It was really fantastic and really insightful. So we have a survey link, which we are posting in the chat and sending via email. The survey should only take a few minutes, and we would really appreciate your feedback as we prepare and continue to do these preparation webinars in the future. As mentioned, a recording of the presentation will be posted on our website, and there will also be a PDF of the slides as well, and the recording will be emailed to you in the coming days once it's available. And additionally, for further NSF resources, you should be sure to check out NSF's, NSF's next set of IUS office hours on January 4, 2024, which is wild to think about, and that'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern time. These office hours are a chance to communicate with NSF program officers and to ask any questions you have about the program. And with that, once again, thank you for joining us today. Take care and happy holidays. <laughs>